Hi everyone, and welcome to the actual nest. I'm gonna do my uh, intro today from the uh, from the place where we put all the kits together. It's a little departure from my uh, studio at home. This week I'm going to be talking about engine mounts. Um, I'm gonna take you through the whole process from the design to analysis of the engine mount strength to putting together the package for the fabrication of the tubes and then once we receive the tubes what we do when we get them and how we put them all together how we build a jig so that we can build it accurately every time for the customer because we're going to be making multiple of these the one we're working on is back here the cgs hawk to polini thor 250 and 303 ds interface engine mount we're going to take you right through uh, again, the fabrication and all the way right through to the powder coating. And, and there's some, some tricks that you got to have for powder coating as well when you want to do an engine mount. We have been sent some awesome video from one of our friends in Spain, Ramon Jose Jimenez, showing us his beautiful classic in flight. And I'm going to finish off again as usual in our usual series uh, with Algie Yates, who's building his tail kit, finishing off his tail kit. He's working on the rudder this week to show you. I think he finishes it off. and. Uh, then um, Algie's going to be purchasing the rest of the kit uh, and uh, he's going to keep on going and we're going to be able to share with him a kit building experience all the way through so that's great. I want to say thanks to everyone who supports you know our company from the obvious kit purchases which we you know they're great uh, you've kept us alive through COVID and accessories and engines but right down to the people who actually, you know, go and buy a t-shirt or buy a cup from our, our web store. And last but not least, all of the people who are in my sphere who contribute tremendously to our effort to keep alive and to keep providing kits for you. And, and don't ask for anything in return from guys who send me drawings and, 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 and people who do, do work on the side and design help and things like that and teach me how to do things. I want to say a big thank you. You guys are our heroes and I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. This is Fisher Flying Products. I'm Dave Hertner. Welcome to The Nest. Our video newsletters provide weekly insight into building and flying our 15 wooden aircraft designs. Polini Motori of Italy is a gracious sponsor of our channel. Polini is the manufacturer of the Thor 250 DS. Cozy Carb Ice Prevention Systems is a proud sponsor of this channel as well. Please take the time to watch our videos to the end, as this assists us in the metrics that YouTube uses to rate our channel. Hit the like button if you feel that the content is worthy. We invite you to subscribe to our channel by clicking on the subscribe button and hitting the bell so that you are notified whenever we post our newsletters. At this time I'm going to go through the engine mount development and manufacturing steps process with you just so you guys can get an idea of you know the proper way to design an engine mount and some of the things that go on you know behind the scenes where we are trying to put out a quality product um, that is safe. Uh, first thing I, we look at is the engine parameters. Uh, we check the weight and the center of mass of the engine and we determine its thrust line. All of this mostly comes from the engine manufacturer and we look for the output flange location um, because we'll have to match that up later on uh, with the firewall and the engine thrust line with the air uh, with the airframe. It's best to get a model of the engine if you can at this point in time early on and that's what we did with the Polini. We got a model, solid model uh, that we could put into the CAD program. Then we looked at the fuselage parameters. We look at the cowl, uh, the output flange to firewall distance, uh, the attachment method, and the quantity of engine mounts. And again, it's really good to make up a model of the front of your airframe or rear if it's a pusher so that you can then work with the engine and place the engine in the model and the airframe in the model and you can put the components and the design components for the engine mount in between them. So from there, what we do is we do an initial concept sketch uh, with the engine and fuselage parameters. 
um, and models in hand, you need to put together, you know, a concept. How is this thing going to going to uh, interface? And what kind of sizing for tubes you might need? Um, and this is kind of an iterative process. You kind of have to go through a few sheets of paper to come up with something uh, before you start mucking around in the in the modeling, um, because you need to kind of have a direction that you're going. So step four is you build the mount model in the CAD software. And this might take two or three tries. As you can see in the photos that we've got, we started off with, with one idea, actually initial idea concept I had. Um, and then the guy, the designer I was working with, he came up with a, with a secondary idea that came off of that. And that's what we ran with. Um, you want to take the and marry the, the mount model with the engine model and the fuselage model. So do this all in CAD. And that gives you, it helps you flush out whether there's any clearances, clearance issues or interference issues. Uh, and we found that with the Polini. Um, the Polini has a, an output flange right in the middle of, 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 the, uh, of the engine, whereas the hearth that it was replacing um, sat w w quite a bit up higher and then used a reduction drive to lower the output flange location. And so we had to make some modifications to the uh, the aft portion of the CGS Hawk to uh, to make sure that we had enough uh, clearance for the uh, motor to sit in uh, where there was a support tubes before. So once you have the model, you know, hashed out and you've got all your clearances and your mounts and everything's all kind of worked out in, in modeling. Then you can take that model and you can put it through what they call an FEA or finite element analysis. And um, there's a software that that's you know within the CAD uh, programs that uh, allow you to do that. And and basically you can you can put loads on the engine, um, you know propeller loads, uh, and then you can see how they translate through the engine mount to the frame. And you can determine at that point in time whether you've got enough. Uh, enough strength in the members that you're using uh, that they don't they don't distort unduly uh, and you can then you can kind of fine-tune your your mount structure by you know going with a thicker tube or a thinner tube or you find that there's no load on a tube or that kind of thing and you can you can play with it and then try to get the best um, uniform stress loading uh, that, that nothing's overloaded uh, and that's that's it's smart to have that done by somebody who really knows what they're doing. An engineer and, and um, an aeronautical engineer uh, knows about aircraft loads, so it's best to go with one of those guys. Once you've got that, you know, sort of design lock uh, on the mount, then you go to the prototyping stage and uh, you take that and you create a, a package um, that goes to a company like VR3 Engineering in Stratford, Ontario that uh, can take that all of those tubes and then they CNC cut them on a CNC tubing cutter so you get all your perfectly notched uh, tube ends um, and they provide a package basically it's like a puzzle and it comes to you comes back to us and um, but one, of, one of the things that you want to make sure at this point in time you do is you make sure you have vent holes um, in in the uh, in each of the pipes any pipes that will be welded completely closed on both ends needs to have um, a small hole in them uh, in a non-stressed area uh, to allow for venting later on and that's important in the uh, in the welding process and it's also important in the um, in the powder coating process so from that prototype stage uh, we, we, we submit that to them they manufacture the parts and we receive those parts back. In the meantime, we also wanted to design a weld jig to weld these components together. During the welding process, uh, you know, parts get pulled here and there because of the cooling of the, of the metals. It's really important to have everything locked down as best as you can in a weld jig so that when you weld it together and you pull it out of the jig, it's gonna do the job and everything's gonna align like you want. Uh, at the same time, what I did was we created a, a specialized table in the shop that uh, is designed to accept weld jigs. Um, it's a 3 8 inch top. I can tap into it. I can drill through it. I can put bolts through it. Uh, and it allows us to fixture those 
uh, components uh, very rigidly and allow them to be welded and to be cooled while still in the in the fixture and then to be able to take the fixture apart and the whole weldment comes out and uh, as one piece. So once we received the CNC cut tubes and then we check that all the parts are in the bags and whatnot then we, we adjust any uh, of the fillets uh, we, we go to put it all together and, and, and fit it if there's anything out slightly uh, burrs or um, you know it may have been cut on a certain angle but you need to clean off a little bit with uh, uh, your die grinder just to make things fit perfectly uh, and then you get everything mounted onto your on your well jig and uh, you want the closest tightest fit as possible um, then one at a time if possible you remove the components and you clean off any mill scale at all of the weld intersections. You can't have mill scale uh, at a weld intersection when you're TIG welding. It'll, it'll create junk in the puddle and um, it really makes, doesn't make for a, a good weld. Uh, and then when you're done that and cleaning it up, you, you, you wipe them off with acetone and, and then you reassemble the parts in the weld jig. So from there then you, you tack all of the individual components together um, into, into a solid weldment. Sometimes there will be two steps to this as in the CG, CGS Hawk planing mount. There was a ring that had to be made first as you can see in the photos and then uh, it had to be welded together first and then it created the reference points to set on pins that were attached to the table now that allowed the whole thing to come up higher so that we could get the other tubes uh, mounted in place. We tack all the parts together. Uh, in our case, because we were using 035 material, 035 wall tubing, we had to use a low power setting on the MIG welder to do this because um, it's just so thin that when you get the arc going for the, the TIG welder, we found that there just wasn't enough finite control on the low end. Uh, we were still blowing through the wall and it was just melting away from us and, and that's no good. So we would come in there with just a shot uh, of, of, of MIG to tack everything in place and hold it in place and that allowed us to go in there later on and finish the job uh, with the TIG welder. Now the, the weldment's removed then from the jig when it's cooled off. You want to let it cool right down and then we want to flip it over and tack the other side. So you always want to have parallel tack or like two-sided tacks. You don't, anytime you have a weld on one side of a tube, it's going to try to pull that tube in that direction. And so you want to really fairly quickly try to get two tacks in, in you know, on all the, the parts that you can kind of access and any that you can't you want to get it flipped over and, and get the tack on the other side before everything cools off. Now with 058 or thicker walls you don't have to use the um, the MIG tack method. It's uh, the thicker wall the 058 it can it can withstand the, you know the arc up and the low end of the tape welder um, depending on your welding skills. Uh, I haven't found um, that welding 058 wall is very difficult at all. Um, but I have found that uh, the 035 is a challenge. There's no doubt about it. At this point is where you need to verify that everything fits. So once you've got everything tacked together, then it's time to get the engine and get the airframe and marry everything up and make sure at this point in time that you don't have any interferences that your dimensions are correct, that your prop placements and clearances, and there hasn't been any mistake in the design because you can. this is where you can actually fix it. It's fairly easy to, to, uh, to grind out some tack welds and, and whatnot and then you know reconfigure what you do or get another part made that needs to be longer or something like that. But those are, those are the important, um, this is the important stage at which to do that. Um, you want to, you don't want any interferences and you want to think forward too and whether you got hoses or whether you've got any other kind of things so for your firewall forward package it's important to understand your um, how the weldment interacts with that are there are you going to have to have any brackets put on it to support other things like your oil can or something like that 
uh, you know, now's the time to have all that stuff figured out. And you can't do that unless you get the engine on there and you get the, you know, uh, and, and it attached to the firewall and you start figuring out your hose routing and stuff like that. Because it might be prudent right now to tack weld a tab on there or to weld a tab onto the engine mount that, that saves you um, having to use Adele clamps or something like that. So it's important to do that. Now, at this point in time, if you've done any tack welding with the MIG welder, you want to wire brush everything clean for dust and dirt from the wig, from the from the, the MIG process, and and replace it back into the positioning jig for for final TIG welding. So, uh, TIG weld as much as the weldment as you can in in the jig as and and you you know you might have to work around it, just, you know. Uh, undulate yourself and your body around it but try to get as much of it welded in the jig as possible before you pull it out to flip it over and then you flip the part over and you weld it the other side and any parts um, that are unreachable you know when it's in the weld jig so after final welding clean off any weld slag from the MIG welding process it, sometimes you'll get little sparks and whatnot they'll kind of stick onto the weldment so you want to clean everything off make sure it's all super uh, clean use a you use a piece of emery cloth or something like that to to make sure that you've got all you know all your parts cleaned up and looks pretty good and you know if you've got any rough edges or anything like that now's the time to you know take it over to the abrasive wheel on your on your die grinder or on your two inch I've got uh, I've got uh, a 3m abrasive pads on my on my two inch um, belt sander and so you can take it over there and clean that up and make it look a little better and then at this point in time, you're, you're going to be looking at sending it out for powder coating. So before you do that, put it back on, on, on the, uh, on the air, airplane one more time. Make sure everything fits. Make sure it's your last chance to kind of to do that. Deburr any holes. Um, make sure that everything's clean because you're going to paint it. And, and if you, after it comes back and it's, and it's painted, you don't want to take you know, a file or anything to it. You want to keep it looking good. And the only thing to check, you know, when it does come back from powder coating is that you don't have any powder coat blobs or anything like that on mount points. You want to you want a straight even surface for any kind of thing that's mating up. And again, I want to reiterate, make sure all of the tubes have uh, at least a 1 inch hole in a sort of a non stressed area uh, so that uh, it can vent out during the um, during the powder coating process. They use very hot ovens for that. And uh, it will actually, you know, the, the, my powder coater said he's, he's seen tubes burst in there that, that uh, just don't have any way for the, for the pressures uh, to be able to handle the pressures. So especially on thin wall, uh, you want to make sure that uh, you've got your uh, vent holes in there. So, and um, that's about it. When, you know, now you've got a finished uh, weld, welded uh, weldment for your engine mount. It's, it is a process. It takes time to do this correctly. And I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people over time have called me up and say, "How much is an engine mount?" You know, and 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 it, they're expensive to to make, especially in low quantities, especially with all the work involved. Um, if you're, you know, if you can imagine going through all of this for a one-off, uh, we end up in in the you know in the fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar range because we've got you know engineering costs that we have to do. We have to do the FEA analysis. We have to make sure that this is a quality product that's being put out and it's welded properly and so we have a professional welder do it uh, oversee it and whatnot uh, so it, it's important to understand that uh, the costs are for these is one of the higher cost portions of our kits so I'm going to uh, end up there and uh, I'm going to go off and uh, here's some of that uh, interesting uh, classic flying out of Spain Bueno, vamos a realizar el primer vuelo de prueba hay un poquito de nervios pero el día es espectacular. A ver qué sensaciones nos da el Fisher.
Vetter. War eine Dumme. In this video, we get the Youngster V rudder basically completed. Remember, I do things my way, not necessarily the right way. But if you get any hints and tips from this video, then all the better. So, let's get cracking! Okay, so, the trailing edge bow of the rudder we saw laminated in the last episode has been sanded. Uh, came out nice and uh, level, very little sanding needed just to remove the glue. Uh, as we found with the uh, laminates in previous episodes, uh, they're remarkably consistent. I've uh, got the uh, spar here for the rudder and you'll see I've got a couple of blocks in place and I can now just place the spar against those blocks and against this lower block here and I can draw in that line there which will be the line I'm going to cut off the end of the lamination. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do after that is I'm going to mark a center line all the way around the the bow itself and the center line on each end of the spar and then I'll cut the spar. Okay so I've uh, cut that I need to sand it to uh, get the absolutely perfectly 90 degrees uh, from the far face and to the angle there so that the spar now is uh, a good close tolerance fit. Uh, because I sanded it and it's end grain you get dust stuck in the grain uh, on the end grain so I've washed it out with uh, a bit of denatured alcohol so I can make sure that we get a good bond that the uh, resin isn't just sitting on top of the dust so it's quite an important thing uh, normally like when I'm uh, doing the routing and sanding for the gussets I blow it out with compressed air but when it's tight end grain like this I, I wash it out as well um, so now we've got that bit sorted this edge here going along here is pretty much a straight edge if I put the the, uh, the blade of my bevel gauge against it you can see that that's a sort of straight edge now if I put the bevel gauge there and get that set I can tighten up that now I've got the angle which I can transfer onto the spar and I'll get the end of the spar uh, cut to that angle the end of the spar is cut. You can see I've drawn a centre line on the spar here and we've got a centre line dr drawn all the way around the bow. At this end I've got the, uh, the centre line drawn which we'll use later and I'm just going to uh, mark on each side of the, uh, the spar this will be in focus okay so I've got the mark which you just saw me put in I've got one that side and one this side so what I'll do is I'll use a square and uh, I'll draw that line right up to the top I'll draw it still using the same edge as a datum this, this side here is a datum I will draw that line there so it can be seen. I'll just put it across the top here a little bit so I can see it there. And then I'll join that with a steel rule. And because that's not quite 90 degrees, there's slight difference in the bow. So that is now matched. I can now cut this off with a tenon saw and dress it, maybe sand it so that it fits the uh, gap between top and bottom as exactly as we can, we can get it with that, enough room for that glue to be in. Okay, so what I've been doing is I made up a gauge uh, for the height of the centre line of the spar and I've lifted this bow up so that the centre line marked on it 
is exactly the same as that so that's all in its relative position I've made up the blocks for the rear of the main spar I've cut and made up this member which is shown on this drawing which is 2a but not shown on drawing 2 but you know I'd rather have it there than not I've made up the blocks to hold it in place against the leading edge and up here the rib I've cut out to shape using the template that one there same as I did on the fin so if you look at the video that's linked up here uh, you'll be able to see how the template was used and I've made up this uh, piece here of uh, F47 which gets bonded on to the rib to make it into the T shape as shown again on that uh, fin video so uh, I'll glue this little lot together here uh, and let that uh, cure off and I'll glue in the main spar uh, with the top block here and the bottom block so we've got a starting point to start putting everything else together I'll deal with uh, this member at the same time as I glue in the forward rudder rib right then so the nose rib has been uh, created uh, I've shaped the uh, F48 using the uh, template the F47 piece has been shaped uh, to match everything and glued to create that T piece the blocks have been uh, made up uh, I ran out of uh, block wood uh, that was wide enough for that so luckily I had some white pine aircraft grade which I could use to make up uh, these blocks and uh, they're all shaped so I'm just going to go and glue this little lot together So the situation now is all this area is glued up, all dried and cured. I've been making up all the blocks for the trailing edges and just behind the spar and the ribs have been basically cut and I'm now about to mark those up about uh, two inches back from where it attaches to the spar tapering it down to the height of the bow itself and I'll taper those with a plane and then they'll all be ready to be uh, fitted and glued okay so basic rudder complete we uh, have all the ribs installed tapered that took a little bit of time to get those nicely tapered to the two inch point Except for the bottom one which is tapered all the way to the front I'll go into that in more detail in the next video in point of fact in the next video we'll deal with the bottom and the top up here uh, as well as the final sort of finishing uh, around the uh, trailing edge and leading edge to get the final sort of shapes there time to this point 27.9 hours Thank you for staying with me to this point and catch you in the next video. Look after yourselves. Thanks again for watching. We try hard to bring you interesting content each week. To help us out, please like and share our videos if you feel the content is worthy. To receive the latest info from Fisher Flying Products, click the subscribe button and ring the bell. See you next time in the nest.